All right, Micah 3, verse 12. Now therefore shall, uh, shall Zion for your sakes be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house as the high places of the forest. So he's going to chop it all down. I think we covered that verse. Feels like it. Um, okay, go to chapter 4, next verse. Chapter 4, verse 1. I'm pretty sure we covered that. I was thinking that we had covered this first verse, but maybe not. Verse 4. Or chapter 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it. That's obviously millennium, because it's not happened yet. <laughs> now, we're in the last days of church age, but we're not in the last days of the last days. <laughs> the very last days, of course, is when God turns to deal with Israel again, and uh, gets them ready for the millennial kingdom. Genesis 49, verse 10, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. That is, there's supposed to be a king of Judah. He said it's not going to depart. Hmm. Well, where is it? <laughs> it's in heaven where it belongs. Uh, nor, the log, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, till Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So one day he's going to be back. He says the, uh, that uh, the people shall flow into it. They're going to come in. It's going to be kind of like our border is people just want to come flowing across there because America is a good country to live in that's the way it's going to be when Jesus sets up the kingdom for the millennium everybody's going to want to be there I mean other than it just being good it's going to be righteous and it'll be attractive Psalm 22 Psalm 22 verse 27 he says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. That is, one day, um, the whole world is going to be seeking God, not a God of their own making, but the one that is there. Uh, it'd be nice if they head that way now, but they don't. They want to either produce a fake God and claim they're worshiping God, or they want to go after something that's totally pagan. Um, the, the guys who say that they don't believe in a God, believe they are God. Uh, try to go against something they want. Psalm 68, Psalm 68, verse 29. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Now, this is a, this is a, a thing you find all the way through the Bible. When you go to visit a king, you don't go empty-handed. It's um, it, it would be bad manners to show up before a king and not bring a gift. Now, I, I don't understand that thing. You would think the, the peasants that want to come in are the poor people. The king is wealthy. However, it's going to be the same spiritually. When we get to heaven, we got nothing. We just got there because he pulled us up. And so you know what he does? He hands us a gift, the crowns. And so we do what everybody is supposed to do before a king. We hand them back. That's our gift we bring him. He says, verse 30, Rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of bulls, that's something satanic, with the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Um... That's in the millennium when he's uh, ruling with a rod of iron. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Hmm. That is, there's something satanic about all of this um, violence. Um, now, God is going to be very violent when he overthrows the Antichrist. However, that's a righteous violence. Man in and of himself has to be very careful that he's in sub submission when he's involved in violence. For instance, when you go to war, when the armies are going to war, they're doing it because they're commanded to, they're following orders. They're not just doing it out of a lust for blood. Otherwise, they come back and they become, you know, serial killers. 
murderers. There's something satanic about that, taking a life. That's what the devil does. His goal is to steal, to kill, and destroy. And when man starts acting that way, it's uh, addictive to him. Verse 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. That'll be the day. <laughs> they never have before. And just historically, it's always been pagan. Very wicked down there. Verse 32. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of earth. O oh, sing praise unto the Lord. Selah. One day it'll all sing to him, and it'll be acceptable. Psalm 72, Psalm 72, verse 7. In his days shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. I like the way he says that. It's, he's not putting a time stamp on it. He says, as long as the moon is up there. Now, somebody will say, well, there, there's going to be no night in the millennium. And that's true, it's going to be daylight. However, the moon's still going to be there because they're keeping track of time. The sun and the moon were made for that purpose, to keep track of time. Not necessarily to control whether or not it's bright outside or whether or not it's dark outside. You know, the moon's design was not to make it dark. The moon doesn't make it dark. The moon gives you light when you're in the dark. <laughs> it just keeps time for us. He says in verse 8, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring presents. There it is again. The king of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all the kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. All through history, it's been, there's something that is just inbred in man to know God rules. So, in order to have power, most governments start out this way. If you go back historically, somebody's coming in, I don't know that. Uh, historically, um, the way they've ruled is they've set themselves up as God or as the, um, the high priest of a religion. And then they have the power in order to tell you what's right and what's wrong and that type of thing. God didn't set his nation up that way. He's going to come back and be God and rule and tell them. And he's going to put his laws in their hearts and in their minds. Verse 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. And men shall bless, him, bless in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doth wondrous things. And blessed be the glorious name for his, uh, his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. <laughs> I like that David's amen in himself. <laughs> He wrote it and he got excited about it. He got to the end of it and said, Amen. You know, one amen wasn't enough. Let's do it again. <laughs> Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 3. He says, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Over and over, the reference is this, every single nation is going to come and worship before him. That's going to require something dramatic. Could you imagine all the nations of the earth right now turning toward the Lord? Just turning that direction. No, can't imagine it. But one day it's going to happen. Well, the only way it's going to happen is if he comes back and cleans house. And one day he's going to. Look at uh, Psalm 110, verse 3. He says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah 11 verse 10. This has a phrase in it to tell you we're heading toward uh, tribulation or millennium. Isaiah 11 10. And in that day, the phrase that day always points to, not today, but the day that's coming. <laughs> There shall be a root of Jesse, 
which shall stand for an ensign of the people. And to it shall the Gentiles seek, and the rest shall be glorious. He's saying there's coming a day even these people they knew as heathen, the Gentiles, are going to seek God. Um, what is natural right now will be flipped on its head in the millennium. It will be natural to be spiritually right with God, and it will be unnatural to find a heathen. Now, you will find them still, uh, but they'll be few and far between. Just like it is now, the Christians, the ones who are seeking God, are few and far between. And one day he's going to flip that thing. Look at uh, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 43, 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. He's gathering Israel in the millennium. Now, there's, he's been encouraging them all along through their history. Now, this encouragement is not the kind of patting on the back encouragement. Every nation the Jews have run to, they've eventually been encouraged with the sword to get out. <laughs> he's trying to push them back to their land. He's got one spot on the globe for the Jews, and it's Israel. Look at Isaiah 49, Isaiah 49, 19. For thy waste and thy desolate places, and the land of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants. And they uh, that swallow thee up shall be far away. That is, one day Israel is not going to be the uh, red-headed stepchild. <laughs> They're not going to be the, the, the whipping post for all the nations. Um, and uh, there's, I'm not going to read that whole passage to you, but you can read it. It all deals with the same subject. Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, verse 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Uh, that your dwelling place, your tent, um, your household. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Curtains, I hate curtains. Amy asked me, to, she, Amy's moving into another place. She, she wanted me to come help with whatever. She said, uh, how did she start that? She said, how, do you, how are you with painting? I said, oh, I hate painting. She didn't know your mom likes it. She said, <laughs> <laughs> She said, she said, well, how about hanging curtains? I said, oh, that's even worse. you got to get them level and all that. She said, well, how about hanging shelves? I said, oh, that's just as bad. She said, well, you don't have to like any of it, but you're going to come do it all. <laughs> <laughs> He's setting up house here. He's telling them, one day you're going to be free to stretch yourself out abroad and claim it all and enjoy it. It's going to be a millennial rest. That is enjoyment. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60 verse 3. Isaiah 60 verse 3. This should have. You know, yeah, this could have. Had Israel obeyed the commandments they were supposed to. That they claimed they were going to. They could have been the light to the Gentiles. They could have been the missionaries to the world. But they didn't. But God didn't throw that plan away. It's still in place. Isaiah 60 verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. That is, he's going to draw all the Jews back into their land. Verse 5. And thou shalt see, and flow together, and thine heart shall fear, and be enlarged. Notice the use of the word fear. People think of fear as being terrible, uh, terrible and uh, terrifying. Um, there's an element of that that's so. However, uh, here he's talking about good things. All your children are going to come back in the lands, and you're going to fear God. Now, you're going to fear a God that's powerful enough to do that. You'll fear crossing him. If he can do something that powerful, then to make him mad, now they'll have just seen what he did to the Armageddon and the Antichrist. 
so that'll have some influence on it. But fear has always been part of God's commands. God intends man to fear him. If there's no fear, then you think you're God. And that's the way it is. Verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian. That's a camel. And uh, Ephah. That dromedary is a wild camel. It's not been tamed yet. Verse 7. All the flocks of Kedar shall gather together unto thee. The rams of... Kelly can tell us that one. Neath Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on thine altar. And I will glorify the house of my glory. Right now Israel is supposed to be the place of his glory. He said he chose Jerusalem to place his name there. However, it ain't so gloriful, glorifying right now. Matter of fact, right now they're in almost the brink of civil war. Uh, they're being bombed left and right. And uh, the big thing was Netanyahu said he was going to reform the courts. The court, their, their Supreme Court is a little different than ours. Theirs, the Supreme Court is not voted in. It's handed off they vote themselves in and it's a lifelong position and then when they retire they handpick somebody to take their place they can overturn any rule on the basis of this phrase it's unreasonable that opens the door wide open to anything so they're legislating from the supreme court and so he said he was going to reform that well when he did that it made the liberals mad and now they've got anarchy um, they started it by influencing the military and so they've got military boycotts and the, the pilots have refused to fly and come to work and of course you know what happens their enemies are taking advantage of it and they've got fires and destruction going everywhere it just tells me the time's getting short soon we're getting out of here look at uh, let's see where that Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 3 Jeremiah 3 verse 17 at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem neither shall they walk any more after their after look at this one could you imagine this happening shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart Whew. Joel Osteen hadn't read that one yet um, <laughs> he's saying right there your heart in and of itself is evil mm. it is because it's selfish it's self-centered uh, he says one day man's not going to depend on the evil of his heart to lead him you know that's the philosophy right now follow your heart well you don't your heart don't even know what it wants <laughs> just wait it'll change by tomorrow Okay, you better dictate it. Now that's why when God comes, he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write my laws in their heart and put them in their mind. Therefore, that will replace the evil of the heart that we have now. Jeremiah 16, Jeremiah 16, verse 19. He says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. Now we use that and we apply it and it's true, but we have not seen affliction. Maybe in the dark ages they did, but the Jews are going to be seeing that, saying this in the tribulation, and it'll be true. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanities, and things wherein there is no profit. That's true. A few of them will wake up in the, millenn or in the tribulation and realize the message they're being preached by the uh, Moses and Elijah and the 144,000 is correct and they'll have their eyes open however it's not going to be many but there will be a handful of Jews and maybe a handful of Gentiles not many Zephaniah 3 Zephaniah 3 verse 9 Zephaniah 3 9 here's the next thing that happens um, I, I, I don't like languages I mean it's all I can do to speak English uh, <laughs> In high school, they said you had to take a language. I don't know why. How about let's just teach English? <laughs> but they said you had to take a language. Well, I tried Spanish 
for a little while and decided that wasn't for me. <laughs> I took sign language as a language because you could do English still in sign language. So <laughs> I did a little cop out there. <laughs> but here one day, everybody's going to get the gift of language. Zephaniah 3 verse 9. And then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. One day we get a pure language. Now, I think English is a pretty good language because it's the only one I know. <laughs> but even in English, our language has changed over the years. Go listen to some teenagers talk. They're speaking English, but they don't mean the, the words they're saying don't mean what I thought they meant. And some words they've made up and I don't know what they mean. <laughs> One day it's all going to get cleaned up, both physically and verbally. Look at uh, Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 verse 16. He says, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. I believe this is going to go on for eternity, but obviously it starts in the millennium. Verse 17. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the north unto Jerusalem to worship the king the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Hmm. That tells you that even in the millennium there is still punishment for going against something God says. Uh, you'll remember that the Antichrist, or the, the devil, comes out at the end of the millennium and tries another rebellion, and that, that'll be his final defeat. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go, uh, go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague. Kind of like what we saw in the tribulation, Moses and Elijah are going to be doing plagues and shutting off the rain, same thing. Where the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That tells you another, um, you know that there is time in the millennium. There has to be time in the millennium because it's a thousand years. <laughs> it can't be a thousand years. You wouldn't know if it was a thousand years or not if there was not time. So when he says in Revelation that there will be time no more, he doesn't mean we're getting rid of the clocks because the sun and the moon will endure forever. What he means is there will be no more chance to repent. The time for that is past. But time will continue. Verse 19. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that shall not come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 20. In that day, there's that phrase again, shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. That's what Israel was supposed to do when they were a nation, was they were supposed to spread God's word everywhere, so much so that they put it on their hands, they put it as frontlets between their eyes, they wrote it on the pillars of their house, um, every room you'd go into, you'd see verses. And like Toby does here. <laughs> uh, verse 21. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrificed shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. That is, he's going to set the bounds of their habitation like he intended, and they're going to dwell in those spots until it's the Feast of Tabernacles. One feast remains. Not the rest of them, but one, the Feast of Tabernacles. And that, that one, they all come in. They all flow in for that one. Malachi 1, Malachi 1, verse 11. Malachi 1, 11. I'm really not giving y'all all the cross references. I'm skipping some of these, so I know it doesn't look like it, but I am. <laughs> Malachi 1.11 <laughs> For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, 
that in and of itself is saying something. The Gentiles in the Old Testament is another way of saying the heathen, the pagans. And he says, my name's going to be great among them. Now, don't you know a Jew reading that is scratching his head from the Old Testament, saying, what Gentiles are going to think God's great? Since when? What, what universe are you living on? But one day it's going to happen. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, and pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, if it's great among the heathen, they're no longer heathen. <laughs> That's the identifying mark. Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 25. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That is, one day Israel's blindness is going to be removed. And that's what he's talking about in our text. Uh, Luke verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, all Israel is going to be saved, but there won't be much left of all of Israel. <laughs> A third of them. And I don't know at what point he starts counting the third. After World War III or, you know, the, the devastation, the Antichrist reeks on this earth and then only a third of those get out uh, you wouldn't want to wait around and try to count on being the Jew that makes it through Revelation 15 Revelation 15 verse 4 who shall not fear thee O Lord and glorify thy name for thou only art holy that's what identifies God. No one can even mimic that. Holiness. If you're going to have holiness, it comes from God. It doesn't come from you. If you start portraying holiness that's just man-made and a, a farce in order to impress somebody, it's just the opposite. It's wickedness. Hmm. It's hypocritical. He says, For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Yeah, when he destroys the Antichrist, that's going to manifest some real judgment. Uh, out of his mouth proceeds a sharp two-edged sword, and with it he destroys completely the works of the devil. Micah 4, Micah 4 verse 2, we made it through one verse. Micah 4 verse 2. Now I'm going to speed up and we're going to cover a bunch of verses at once, and then we'll go back and pick them apart. Micah 4 verse 2. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. <clears throat> and he shall judge among many, uh, many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their pruning uh, spears, uh, pruning hooks and their spears into pruning hooks. Let me read that again. I've got that all messed up. <laughs> they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine. And under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord hath, uh, of hosts hath spoken it. That's the the saying they have on the building for the UN that they're going to beat their uh, spears and their swords into plowshares and all that and those are the people in charge of doing just the opposite produce mass producing and underhandedly selling weapons of mass destruction and trying to control the population uh, yet they've got a false advertising out front on the building. We're, we're beating spears into pruning hooks. and You, you can prune your life with that hook is what they're doing. <laughs> now this is an interesting phrase and we'll get there when we get there. But three times that phrase shows up in the Bible. Of those three times, one time it reverses and says, Now take your pruning hook and turn it into a spear. And take your 
plowshare and turn it into whatever it is there. Uh, sword. Sword and spear. Uh, one time it reverses and you're supposed to do just the opposite with it. And we'll cover all the good news on that in a minute. <laughs> What's going on in our passage here is the millennium is coming and Christ is ruling. Until you have the prince of righteousness, you don't really have the prince of peace. You've got a phony peace going on. When the Antichrist comes in, he comes in with the guise as though he's going to give peace. And he sits down peaceably and sits down at the peace treaty table and signs uh, fake agreements with all these different nations and we're going to give Israel peace and all, but it's only demonic peace. Demonic peace is this. It gives you rest for a moment and then it replaces it with more unrest than you had before you thought you got rest. Wickedness. Uh, look at, um, I'll give you a few references and then we'll call it a day. Uh, what time we start on? 16? Oh, we got time. Psalm 2, Psalm 2, verse 5. Psalm 2, verse 5. Uh, psalm 2 is a, is a um, psalm about the tribulation and the millennium. Psalm 2, verse 5. I didn't put enough verses in here, so I'll turn there. It begins with, um, why do the heathen rage and the uh, people imagine a vain thing? The rulers of the earth set themselves, that the kings of the earth set themselves, um, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Okay, that's obviously in the tribulation when they're going actually against him. Uh, Armageddon. Um, our verse is going to be verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Why is that important? Look down at verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The warning, verse 12. Kiss the sun, capital S, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. That is one day he's coming back and he means business. He's given man, he always does this, space to repent. That is a time to get right and do it on your own. When he won't do it on his own, he says, okay, I'll come encourage you. <laughs> my, I guess everybody has grown up with this little phrase, but my dad used to say this, you, you never complained or cried about anything around him. He said, dry it up or I'll give you a reason to cry. <laughs> That's what God's doing. He says, I'm giving you a space to get it right on your own. Otherwise, I have a rod of iron and I'll come back and set it straight myself. And one day he will. Uh, look at um, Psalm 72. Psalm 72 verse 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from river unto, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. That is, one day he's coming back and nothing will be outside of his rule. We've never seen anything like that. Now we've seen some people, some men rise up and intend to do that. The Antichrist, of course, is going to be the most successful of them all. But we've seen uh, Hitler tried to do it. Uh, Alexander the Great tried to do it. Uh, over and over, Charlemagne... Uh, they've all tried to rise to the top and rule everybody, control everything. Because one day that's what God's going to do on this earth physically, visibly. Look at uh, Psalm 72 verse 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Uh, Psalm 82, 82 verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth. For thou shalt inherit all nations. That is, there's not, that's Psalm 82, verse uh, 8. There's not anybody, any ruling class or governmental operation that's going to get outside of him taking charge of it. I wish he was doing it now. <laughs> now, he is. We just don't see it. Right now, he's setting up nations and he's pulling them down. However, his end goal right now is not millennium. The end goal right now 
is get all the earth set up so that it'll go to war in one place and I can squish them with one step. He said, it's my goal to gather you nations together so that I can pour out my wrath on them. Hmm. So when wickedness starts to prevail, we understand why. He's getting it all set up so that he can stomp them in one, in one step. <laughs> and he's going to do it. Look at Psalm 96. Psalm 96, verse 13. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. That's the only one that matters. That's a phrase that people use. And I'm going to show you how it's satanic. Truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. There's only one. And you know who owns it? Truth is owned by God. So if somebody tells you my truth, they're claiming to be God. He says in our verse that he's going to judge the people with his truth. Doesn't matter what you claim is your truth. There's only one that matters, his truth. He owns it. Amen. Psalm 98, Psalm 98 verse 9. Before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness uh, shall he judge. Now, we can f identify some things that are right and not right, but rarely does a nation or a judge sit on the bench and say what is righteous. Righteous means what does God dictate as true. You don't find any judge that does that. They judge according to the dictates of what law tells them to do. But not so with God. Everything rises and falls at his word. And so he is righteous out of his mouth proceeds law. When he speaks, it is law. Look at Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the north, uh, the north and the south. And it shall come to pass... In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Sounds just like what we've been reading in our text, isn't it? And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of uh, the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion goeth forth a law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords. So forth, so on. One day he's going to physically say. I'm put up with all I'm putting up with. Now I'm drawing the line. And until he does that. It seems like. The longer he lets man think he's getting away with something. The worse he gets. Uh, they say that. Um. The, the way to a parent is gentle parent. That is, let the kid do what he wants to. No, he's not going to naturally do the right thing. You've got to give him some guidelines. And it seems like the freer a hand you have with it, the wilder the kid gets. <laughs> That's this earth. This earth has gotten wild because God says one of the punishments I'm doing is I'm not going to correct your children when they sin. Mm. That's a curse of God is to remove his hand of punishment. Mm. That's let it build up so I can come back and knock it all out at once. Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9 verse 6. He says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You can take that list right there and identify what most people are searching for. His name is going to be called Wonderful. That's what man wants. <laughs> he wants Wonderful. Now, especially a Jew, something full of wonder. They seek signs and wonders. So he comes back as wonderful. He says, counselor. That's appealing to America. 
America right now, everybody has some condition that you have to go see a counselor for. Uh, I think that there's going to be quite a, uh, a come to Jesus meeting when we get to heaven and he says, I was the counselor. You gave somebody else my title and gave them homage and listened to them instead of me. I told you from the beginning, I'm a counselor. Okay. He says, the mighty God. That is, Jesus is God. <laughs> you, you get that out of both Testaments. For anybody to not see that, they don't want to see it. Uh, you have to be educated out of seeing plain truth. He says, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Everybody wants peace, they think. But you don't get peace unless you get the Prince of Peace. And he doesn't come without righteousness. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11 verse 1. He says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall uh, make of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and remove, and, uh, remove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. One day that's coming and that's what he's preaching about. This is the, I can't give you all the cross reference. I, don't, I give you a bunch of them. But if you start tallying up all the cross references, you start seeing what subjects the Bible talks about. By and large, your Old Testament has one subject in mind all the way through, and that is the millennial kingdom. One day Jesus Christ is coming to rule physically on this earth. That's most all of your cross references have some prophecy toward that from the Old Testament. Look at in Isaiah 24, Isaiah 24, 23. The moon shall be confounded and the sun is, uh, and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before the ancients gloriously. That is He'll be so um, physically bright. Remember when Moses spent 40 days with the Lord, remember what happened to him? He came down off the mountain and the people said, "Put cover that face up, it's too bright, we can't look at you. It's a physical change. Now I think what's going to happen in the millennium, uh, I could say I know it, is that things physical will also take on something spiritual. The two, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, are joined at the same time. Just like it was in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, they could eat something physical and it gave them sin. Hmm, imagine that. It's going to reverse in the millennium. You could eat something physical and get righteousness from it. The leaves of the tree of life are going to be for the healing of the nations. Could you imagine going out and eating a leaf in order to heal your nation? <laughs> One day it'll be possible. It's going to be a, a wild thing. Uh, I can't give you all the rest of these cross references. Let's try one more. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 verse 14. And there was given him a, a diadem and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. That's what God's excited about. If you read your Bible, look, you won't go very many verses before he starts talking about it again or prophesying about it or giving you a description of it. I know we're headed to heaven, but you have very few Bible verses about what you get in heaven. You don't get a whole bunch of information about that. You do get a whole bunch of information about what millennial kingdom is going to be like with Jesus sitting here on the throne. Because that's what God gets excited about. So as you go through your Old Testament, start noticing those things. Start jotting them down somewhere and you'll end up with more cross-references than, than what I even give you. <laughs> Alright, we better stop it there. I'll pick up next week at uh, Micah 4. We'll go back to verse 3.